Hello. Good Hi. evening. Thanks for joining us this evening. Um, welcome to Night with the Experts. Tonight's um, event is titled Nuclear Power and Weapons, The Connections, featuring Arjun Makajani. Hosting it is Nuclear Energy Information Service based in Chicago, Illinois. I'm Gail Snyder, and I serve as board president. The purpose of Night with the Experts is to turn the tables on the typical format and allow you, the attendees, the majority of the time to ask questions of the expert. Our speaker will have 20 minutes to speak, then the remainder of the time will be for all of us to ask him questions. Uh, before I introduce introduce tonight's expert, I would like to introduce you to our board members, <clears throat> excuse me, and our director. First, uh, Linda Lewison, who serves as our secretary. Linda, would you like to unmute and introduce yourself? Hi. Hi, everybody. It's really good to see you. Um, next, uh, let's see. I'm not sure. Is Kathleen on the call? Uh, one of our board members, Kathleen Rude, who serves as our treasurer. Um, I can't see if she's on the call. <clears throat> oh, next is Stephanie Belenko, one of our board members. Stephanie, would you like to unmute? I am unmuted. Oh, and I was just going to say, <laughs> say hi. <laughs> okay. Hi, my name is Stephanie Belenko. I've been a board member for about uh, seven years, and I'm very happy uh, to be on this Zoom call tonight because uh, it is so um, really awful that nuclear power is connected with nuclear weapons, which are immoral and now illegal. Good point. Next is uh, Jan Bodar, another of our board members. Would you like to unmute and say hi, Jan? Uh, hi, everybody. It's very good to be here. And uh, I'm hoping that we will... Uh, Think about the idea that it's going to be very hard to get rid of nuclear weapons without getting to nuclear power, getting rid of nuclear power first. That's all. And uh, last uh, is Dave Kraft, our director. Uh, he'll be helping out with the chat as well as Jan will be he helping out with the chat tonight. So Dave, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, Dave Kraft here in Chicago, Logan Square. And uh, so glad to have Arjun with us tonight. It's been a long time since we worked together. Glad to have you back. So uh, I'm going to introduce our speaker in just a moment. I want to let you know that he'll have 20 minutes to speak. And then after that, we'll open up the chat to questions and answers. If you have, um, we ask that you please keep your, uh, your screen on mute so that we don't get any background noise while um, our speaker is uh, presenting his presentation have some slides that are going to be shown. Uh, this will be recorded and then we will put it up on YouTube later. Um, and also, um, if we if you cannot uh, put a lot into the chat while Arjun is speaking, because then that's distracting. So it's that will be uh, kind of shut down the chat for a while. And then once he's done speaking, we'll open up the chat. People can put say they want to ask a question or say stack and Jan and Dave will uh, moderate that. So Nuclear Power and Weapons, The Connections. So on January 22nd of this month, the International Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons came into full force, having been ratified now by 51 parties of the 86 sovereign signatories to the treaty. This is the most important international agreement on nuclear weapons since the non since the nonproliferation treaty came into force in a treaty that the United States was instrumental in bringing to fruition. What people and governments constantly overlook is that nuclear weapon programs often come from nuclear power programs around the world, linking the two inextricably. Um, a few days later, the uh, Bulletin of Atomic Scientists also announced that they are keeping the doomsday clock at 100 uh, seconds to midnight because of the numerous threats we're under and of course, uh, the main one being uh, nuclear uh, power and nu well, nuclear weapons, really, for them. So our speaker this evening, Dr. Arjun Makajani, is the director of the Institute for Energy and Environmental Research, also known as IEER. Uh, it's based in Tacoma Park, Maryland. And Dr. Makajani is a physicist and noted national expert. He's the author of the 2007 book, 
free, nuclear free, a roadmap for U.S. energy policy. It's available on his website, and we'll provide a link in the chat later, um, uh, available for free on PD in PDF form. Um, his book predates the Green New Deal in any form by nearly a decade. So, you know, he's ahead of the curve. Uh, he is also the co-author of The Nuclear Deception, U.S. Nuclear Mythology, from electricity to cheap to meter to inherently safe reactors. He's advised the state of Maryland on the implementation of the Renewable Maryland Project, and he has written extensively on the issues of disarmament and non-proliferation. And with that, I'd like to introduce Arjun Makajani. Well, thank you very, very much. Um, let me uh, share my screen. I'll show you some slides. I will try to put it in presentation mode. There we go. Um, can you see the full screen? Okay. Yes. So the connections between nuclear weapons and nuclear power. It's not always what you think. It goes both ways. Um, so here are the actual structural connections. It's not a incidental connection, it's structural. So the first bullet is people. Left side, you have weapons. Right side, you have power. This is sort of the technological and people infrastructure. It's basically the same. You need nuclear physics, chemistry, engineering. <clears throat> the raw material is the same. There's only one raw material in nature that's available in any quantity that has um, fissile material in it is the 235 isotope of uranium. Uh, thorium is not fissile. It needs to be converted into a fissile material in a reactor. Uh, <clears throat> so there's only one material actually, uranium. And it's not easy to make into bombs. So you have to process uranium and enrich. By enrich, you mean increase the proportion of the fissile component, 235 from 0.7% to, well, about 50% anyway, normally 90% or more, uh, that's for bombs, or to make plutonium in a reactor, and then you can use plutonium for bomb, plutonium-239. On the right side, you see it's the same raw material, you have to process it, you have to, sometimes, sometimes you enrich it for fuel, sometimes not, the Canadians don't. Uh, <clears throat> the main difference technologically is the nuclear reactor, a nuclear bomb is supposed to go bang. It happens very fast. You need a runaway chain reaction, otherwise it'll fizzle. In a nuclear reactor, you obviously don't want a runaway chain reaction. You need a sustained chain reaction. Uh, and so you have to ensure that the chain reaction stays controlled. Chernobyl was an example of what happens when it doesn't. Uh, and of course, nuclear bomb events are what happens when to have a runaway chain reaction as designed. So those are the major technical issues. So here's what none other than Robert Oppenheimer said about the connection in 1946. A nuclear weapons convention was proposed. Um, it wasn't an, a sincere proposal by Bernard Baruch at the United Nations. They said, well, you get rid of your weapons, ensure that we won't have, and then, you know, then we'll see. Uh, that's a little bit of a caricature, but not by a long margin. So this is what Oppenheimer said would happen if a nuclear weapons convention were signed. We know very well what we would do if we signed such a nuclear weapons convention. We would not make atomic weapons, at least not to start with, but we would build enormous plants and we would call them power plants. Maybe they would produce power. We would design these plants in such a way that they could be converted with maximum ease and minimum time delay to the production of atomic weapons, saying this is just in case somebody two times us. We would stockpile uranium. We would keep as many of our developments secret as possible. We would locate our plants not where they would do the most good for the production of power, but where they would do the most good for the protection against enemy attack. Now, I, 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 I haven't suggested it in writing here, but I have for this very reason, in case other people two time us, you know, planning to violate the treaty before it's signed. I, this is why I have suggested the most important advisors on US and treaties should be Native Americans. Okay, 
So how did we actually, so the United States initially was, you know, they built the reactors for the bombs. The whole Manhattan Project was open to the bombs. And at the time, there were a lot of studies. Should we do power? What will it cost? I always thought because, you know, Louis Strauss said it'll be too cheap to meter in 1954, that people believed that it would be cheap, but it was that they were mistaken. When we researched it in the book, Nuclear Power Deception, we found that was not right. Um, the Soviets had done their hydrogen bomb in 53. The US had done a hydrogen device in 52. Eisenhower was going before the United Nations to speak. It was a gloom and doom draft that he saw. He didn't like it. He basically said, give me something good to say. Can't be all gloom and doom. Give me, so it was a messaging exercise and they came up with Atoms for Peace. And that's where the whole idea, so Atoms for Peace was in a context where every single technical study that was done to date said nuclear power will be very expensive and more expensive than, almost all of them said it'd be more expensive than coal, be technically complicated. Uh, and I'll tell you why it's, inherently more expensive, sort of, in, you can't really make it cheap. And um, so it was basically a, around a, a fig leaf on the hydrogen bomb. And similarly, the non-proliferation tree, so the United States said, okay, you don't, you forswear nuclear weapons and we'll give you this wonderful energy source. It'll be beautiful, you'll see, you'll solve your problems. And, um, after the 1964 Chinese test, the same idea was carried forward into the non-proliferation treaty. We'll give you this wonderful inalienable right to nuclear power, but don't have nuclear weapons or we'll punish you. So what is a nuclear reactor? Nuclear reactor, this is a, you know, campfire, the kettle. Nuclear reactor is exactly the same thing. It's a boiler, it's inside, this is in Finland, it's inside this dome. Uh, there's a kettle inside the dome. It's rather big and expensive. And the fuel is inside the kettle. That's where you have the chain reaction, makes the water very hot, but it's just a boiler. And one of the reasons a nuclear power plant for electricity can't really be cheap is the boiler is more expensive than a coal boiler or a gas boiler because it's so complicated and you have to, you know. And then downstream, you have to have the generator, you have to have the steam turbine, you have to have the transmission, you have to have the distribution. That 75% of the costs are downstream from the boiler. So even if your fuel costs zero, your power is gonna cost at least 80, 90% of what it costs you to do coal. And um, other than fuel costs. So you're stuck with high costs with nuclear power relative to say fossil fuel. Because of the cost of the boiler, even though the fuel is free, which it is not. So what happens in a nuclear reactor is you put uranium fuel, some of it becomes plutonium, and uh, some of the plutonium actually gets consumed. Uh, you get, some of it is left over uh, at the end when the fuel is drawn as spent fuel. And um, so you're making plutonium, weapons usable material mixed up with uranium and fission products as the reactor goes, inherently. So to make the fuel, you have uranium, and these are centrifuges. Um, they're very slender, they spin very fast. It's like a washing machine, except it spins much faster. 50,000 RPM, for example. Um, we have 80,000 80, metric tons of spent fuel in the United States alone, equivalent to 100,000 Nagasaki-sized bombs of plutonium if it is separated. A lot of global commercial plutonium separated. 300 metric tons is surplus, more than what has been used in reactors. It was meant for reactor fuel. That's enough for 30 to 60,000 bombs, depending on how clever you are in making bombs. Five countries have this surplus plutonium. And um, it's surplus because it's kind of expensive and difficult to use as a fuel in existing light water reactors. It's a kind of a complicated story. The bottom picture is called a button. It's pluton It's a plutonium button. Um, it's a US Department of Energy photo. That's sort of the step before you make the core of nuclear bombs. 
and the same same material can be used as fuel for a reactor. So these are the two common material starting points between reactors. So enriched uranium. So these can be also used to make bomb grade uranium highly enriched. This is plutonium metal. Inherently, you can use it for bombs or if you you know process it suitably for for, um, for reactor fuel. So. One of the things that has happened is that bombs have hidden behind energy. At the end of the Cold War, the nuclear weapons establishment was a little afraid. Maybe we would become obsolete. The Cold War is over. Weapons will no longer be made. What are we going to do? We need a job of the kind, you know, obviously it didn't say these things in so many words, but there was a very interesting paper published on the front on the front cover of Technology Review, MIT Alumni Magazine, in which they suggested an underground steel chamber in which you had three plutonium bombs of one kiloton each exploding every hour to produce one nuclear reactor equivalent. And it would heat up molten salt, that would make steam, and then you would run steam to drive a turbine. That's 25,000 bombs per reactor per year two and a half million bombs to run a system about the size of the nuclear power system we have in the United States, about 20% of US electricity. The total number of war warheads, war bombs made in the United States and the Soviet Union were a little north of our, about 125,000, about 3,000 per year. We're talking 25,000 bombs per reactor per year. There wasn't a whole lot of discussion about nuclear waste, the mess you make in making the bombs, but they said it would be cheap. <laughs> they did. Four cents a kilowatt hour. It's in the article. Um, it, the, the reference, the, the URL is in my slides. Will you give me a five minute signal, please? Okay. The Saudis looking at Iran in 2006 said they were going to go into civilian nuclear power. And the foreign minister said this, it is not a threat. You know, I don't know. I'm, I'm not going to characterize it. It is not a threat. He said. We want no bombs. Our policy is to have a region free of nuclear weapons. And that they said that Israel had the original sin was making a nuclear reactor for bomb purposes. So basically, Mohammed El Baradai looked at this kind of statement back then. He was the head of the International Atomic Energy Agency. And he frankly said, you know, this is basically putting the infrastructure for weapons into place. So you can see basically the infrastructure is the same. The last step of the infrastructure, where you have to make the bomb and time it to go off in a very short time and have a runaway chain reaction. That's different from a reactor. So the control systems are different. In one, you want uncontrolled reaction. In the other, you want a controlled reaction. So that part is very, very different. The rest is pretty much the same. So here were the routes to the nuclear bombs of the various countries, US, Soviet Union, Britain, France, and China. The bombs came first, the power came later. Um, in, in Britain Fra and France, really, it was very close. It was one on the heels of the other. It's hard, hard to distinguish between them, but, but literally the bombs, the bomb infrastructure came first and the power came second, but it was hand in hand. Israel had bombs only, as initially assisted by France in the late 50s. India had atoms for peace um, under that rubric. Uh, infrastructure supplied by the Canadians, heavy water came from the US, I believe, if remembering correctly. Uh, that supplied the plutonium for the 1974 test. The power program was on a parallel track, the United States um, GE had two reactors built in India in the same period, uh, but that was not used for the bomb program. It was this research program. So very, very often when we talk about the connections, it's really the technical infrastructure, the people infrastructure, the educational infrastructure, where people learn things, what is a chain reaction? How do you manage it? What are the neutron absorbing materials? How do you make a runaway chain reaction? How do you control it? All of that infrastructure is common. In Pakistan, um, their, their nuclear weapons leader, uh, Mr. Khan, Dr. Khan, um, basically diverted enrichment technology when he was working in Holland uh, after India had the test. 
and went back to Pakistan and they started their weapons program. Power came later. North Korea was backwards. They had a small power reactor and then their reprocessing and bomb came later. The bomb came much later actually, um, after the agreed agreement between the United States and, and North Korea in 1994 called the Agreed Framework fell apart. So here, I think nuclear weapons and power are inherently undemocratic. Here is Alvin Weinberg in 1971. And I want to read this and then I'll stop. This is my last slide. In a sense, we have established a military freedom. Now, he's first talking about bombs and then power. And about power, he was basically talking about plutonium or nuclear reactors a lot. In a sense, we have established a military priesthood which guards against inadvertent use of nuclear weapons, which maintains what a priori seems to be a precarious balance between readiness to go to war and vigilance against human errors that would precipitate war. It seems to me, and I, in this I repeat some views expressed very well by Atomic Energy Commissioner Wilford Johnson, that peaceful nuclear energy probably will make demands of the same sort on our society of, and possibly of even longer duration. I want to note priesthoods are inherently not democratic. Um, this is a secret society. At the end of the Cold War, uh, W. Henson Moore, I think his name was, Deputy Energy Secretary said in Rocky Flats, where the, all, the whole mess was coming to light, he said this was a secret op operation, not subject to laws. And nuclear power is part of the same structure. You have missile materials, it has to be guarded. Um, if the plutonium is separated and stolen, then somebody could make bombs, you know, um, Lots of people have had those kinds of ideas. So it's a very intimate connection. I personally think that the danger of nuclear power leading to nuclear weapons has been bigger and more important and a more important threat in the last 20 years than before. Initially, it was a more mixed picture and a more of an infrastructural connection. But going forward, I think because we don't have disarmament, because the nuclear weapon states haven't been serious about their commitments and um, the fate, the different fates of North Korea, Iran and Iraq and Syria and Libya, you know, who all had various types of nuclear weapons aspirations have, or supposedly nuclear weapons aspirations. Um, those different fates have been looked at um, by people and they thought, you know, if we can legitimately slip it in under Article 4 of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, um, then we're good to go because almost everything is the same and in an emergency we can always get at the plutonium or use the enrichment plants for highly enriched uranium for bombs. Um, so I'll, I'll stop with a story of from 2004. Um, I was in uh, Mumbai visiting my mother and also for one of these uh, global um, alternative summits forums. And I met a young man from West Africa and he said, you know, my country should, was very well um, considered, you know, thoughtful young man. And he said, my country should make nuclear weapons. And I said, why? And he said, well, if you look at what the United States is doing and how it treats various countries, I think the only way to protect yourself is if you have nuclear weapons. So I'll leave it there. The importance of the treaty is very great. We need to bring the weapon states into it. And of course, we'll be still stuck with a lot of people to do about that. Maybe we can discuss it. I open it up to questions. Dave. Okay, you're back. So I'm gonna turn it back to okay. Dave, who will moderate this. And Jan and I are gonna monitor the chat box. After okay, you. well, um, I think it, it really kind of goes over to Jan at this point, and I don't know if you heard me before, but I want to say thank you, Arjun, for such a concise explanation of such a complex topic. Uh, so, Jan, would you like to tell us who are, are – oh, and I just want to mention one thing. Sometimes board members will be in the uh, – in in line to ask a question, but sometimes we'll skip them and take it to someone who's a guest on Night with the Experts. So if you're looking at the chat and you wonder why we might skip – the board members, we know that we can ask at the end or, or contact Arjun later with our burning questions. So we wanna give everyone else who's a guest here to uh, really ask their questions. So Jan, who, who's our first uh, 
Uh, the, the first person is Alfred Meyer, and he will be uh, followed by Roger Johnson. And I'll ask Roger to go ahead and read his own question, although it is in the chat. And after that, Tracy McClellan. Alfred, go ahead, please. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Gail. Thank you so much, Arjun. Um, I'd like to suggest that there is a, a growing body of evidence from the industry itself, or at least from the government itself, uh, acknowledging that nuclear power is fundamental for our to our nuclear weapons supply. And mm -hmm. I would turn first to the uh, August 2017 report that uh, Ernie Moniz's uh, organization, energyfuturesinitiative.org, reports. The, the, the title of the report is The U.S. Nuclear Energy Enterprise, a key national security enabler. And quoting from page 11, I read, the picture is clear. A stabilized existing reactor fleet and new builds, perhaps incentivized by the favorable emissions characteristics of nuclear power, will be needed to rebuild a supply chain that will underpin both clean energy and national security success. And in this report, which I highly commend, he notes that uh, seven states have more than 31 uh, supply chain companies operating. 11 states have 16 to 30 supply chain companies operating. And 25 states have one to 15 uh, supply chain companies operating. So we've only emitted seven states from this nuclear endeavor. But um, I would suggest that Mr. Moniz's uh, report supports this. And then I'd also say that the Atlantic Council, a, a DC think tank, has. Uh, issued a report which, again, the value of the U.S. nuclear power com complex to U.S. national security. And again, it um, is quite specific in saying, uh, you know, how important it, it says there are three main reasons for public support of the civilian nuclear industry for national security purposes which are identified in the analysis that follows. The reasons are one, the civilian nuclear industry generates a vast investment in human capital, which, is in, which means new nuclear uh, physicists, uh, which is a necessary condition for all applications of nuclear energy in the national security apparatus. Two, it says the civilian nuclear industry and its associated supply chain provides critical risk mitigation and procurement safety to the national security apparatus. And three, the civilian nuclear industry's value to national security priorities related to climate change. So I would suggest that the uh, fallacious claim, Arjun, that you pointed out in uh, the nuclear power deception, that it's energy too cheap to meter, really is that the, we, we need the cover story. We need the cover story that says nuclear activities are for climate change mitigation, the, the, the atoms for peace, whatever it is other than nuclear weapons, when in fact, this is specifically for nuclear weapons. And I think this explains much of the economic incongruities uh, that we see in efforts to create new nuclear uh, power reactors. But thank you, Arjun, for what you've uh, shared with us tonight. Thank you, Alfred. Let, let, let me comment on that. I, I don't actually agree with it. Uh, I don't agree with the Moniz analysis oh. or the Atlantic Council analysis. And the reason is the nuclear power industry is dying because it's an economic dinosaur. And apart from all the safety and spent fuel, you know, 
The establishment has never really cared that much about these questions. And, you know, Alvin Weinberg himself admitted that lots of people from the establishment have admitted it. They are flailing about for some justification for massive expenditures, whether it's climate or it's going to be infrastructure. I just want to point out to you, if you if you really want to make bombs, just look at the Manhattan Project. They felt they needed them. They didn't have any reactors. They hadn't proved a chain reaction. They gave the go ahead on October 9th, 1941, when Vannevar Bush briefed FDR and FDR said, go. And they started the massive investments. And they had a bomb by July 16, 1945, three and a half years, and a little bit more than three and a half years. And at that time, they didn't have any blueprints. Today, they have the blueprints. You don't really need new. And the weapons people are doing the same thing. They're saying you need to modernize. Uh, we need to make new weapons pits. They don't need to make new weapons pits. Plutonium, unlike us, plutonium pits actually anneal from self-heating with age. So they don't, they get better with age. Actually, They don't get worse with age. Uh, now, they don't need to make new plutonium pits. This is the people who've gotten used to having very cushy jobs at taxpayer expense, making excuses in order to get more taxpayer money. And I, I do not at all subscribe to Ernie Moniz's analysis. It's appealing to, it's what I was saying, you know, it's, it's sort of power hiding behind bombs. Bombs have hidden behind power, but what you have illustrated, and thank you for bringing it up, if I had another slide, I would put that in and say, here's power hiding behind bombs. At most, you could say, you know, you have a few more nuclear engineers if you had nuclear power. But really, I don't agree. I think they're just looking for public money and pork barrel and, and endless amounts of money to stay in business for what they like to do. It has uh, no I, I agree with you, Arjun, about looking for endless amounts of money. And this, in fact, is the purpose is that there needs to be a very big flow of research money into academia. We need to be able to draw young, smart science students into nuclear engineering. And, and to say that you're going to make nuclear bombs is not a particularly socially acceptable uh, position. But to say that you're going to solve climate change with uh, nuclear energy, that sounds pretty good. So it's it's the cover story. Nuclear energy is the cover story for the bombs. They and don't. The bomb. I, I don't agree. They don't really need nuclear engineers to make bombs. They've already got the bombs. At most, they need to get rid of the high explosives around and refurbish the bombs. They've got a giant factory in Pentex near Amarillo to do all that. They have a lot of qualified people. They can retrain them. They don't need a whole lot of nuclear physicists and engineers. There are plenty going through the existing system. Certainly, they don't need more money and more. I, I just don't agree with the whole thing that a lot more money in power will sustain a bomb complex because I don't think the bomb complex really needs that. The bomb complex is saying, you know, we need a trillion dollars of refurbishment because they want all that money. And so I, I don't think it's necessary to sustain uh, a nuclear arsenal. I think both sides just want public money and they're using national security as an excuse to milk the public. Okay, Roger, uh, do you want to read your question or do you want yeah, me? To no. Can you hear me? Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thank you for organizing this meeting. Question about terrorism. Uh, many think it's the biggest threat to nuclear power plants, particularly for um, plants near the coastal areas like San Onofre, yet it's hardly ever discussed. Uh, Israel sells on arms market uh, missiles designed to be disguised in container ships, four in a pod, 200 mile range, 1200 pound warheads. And uh, there's 80,000 containers that pass by this area every day and 2% are inspected. There are roads that go right past the plant. You can get out of your car and throw a stone and hit the isfasi. Uh, it, it's a huge threat and nobody discusses it. How do the nuclear uh, industry get away with not discussing this? Who should discuss it? And uh, what co credible threats are there that we need to know about? I think this should be a huge issue and it's not. Oh, you know. 
we've all become much more aware after 9-11 of the threats that both the, on the dry gas storage as well as the spent fuel pools, not to speak of the reactors themselves, pose in terms of malevolent acts and, you know, aircraft crashing into reactors, the spent fuel pools, and so on. And, um, you know, many of us, including yours truly, uh, have discussed this. I mean, one of the first things I did after 9-11 uh, was to write a report on this very topic because, I mean, I hadn't worried about it a whole lot before, to be honest, but 9-11 made it very, very clear. It was a huge problem. And I, um, you know, put forward the quest, the concept of hardened on-site storage. I, in fact, invented the acronym HOSS uh, that is in wide use in our community now uh, in 2002. Um, we haven't been able to convince the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, that it's important to um, harden on-site storage or lighten the spent fuel pool burdens of the amount of spent fuel that's stored. Um, I mean, the public generally is not that focused on nuclear issues, even though Osama bin Laden has said, you know, nuclear bombs that, yeah, you know, he could think of using them and many others too, um, and terrorists threats, malevolent threats against nuclear infrastructure have been known for a long time, since the 1970s at least, before, uh, if not before. So, I mean, I, I really don't have a very good answer for what it will take to wake up the public. I mean, a couple of years ago, I did a tour of Texas calling attention to this problem because the uh, consolidated storage, uh, um, you know, we woke a few people up, I think, I think, uh, it takes maybe consistent grassroots organizing, not my expertise, but but maybe that's what it takes. Presence every day in the community, calling attention to the problem. Who and, could we get to talk about it? Sorry? Who could we get to talk about it? The Defense Department? The Department of Energy? Uh, the NRC is never going to discuss it. Well, the NRC, N NRC, yeah, NRC has refused to, you know, even listen to the National Academy of Sciences in the matter of uh, reducing the burdens of spent fuel in, in packed pools. So, I mean, I, I wouldn't look to the government for any particular relief on this question. It has to be people from the community. I mean, every large community has technical experts that, that you can persuade to educate the community and bring them to the policymakers. The trouble is we have fed, federal preemption of nuclear safety issues. So local and state governments have almost no leverage to no leverage to require stronger safety and you know uh, men, some of us have suggested not me alone but others uh, more strongly than me uh, legal experts on the atomic energy act that the federal government should set minimum standards for nuclear safety uh, and that should be done by the nrc but states should be allowed to set stronger standards I think that would be a very good idea and that would allow, you know, states like California or Florida or Massachusetts to set stronger standards for storage of spent fuel should they want. I think it is possible to do that. The Germans do it. They do ardent storage. They have much better casks than we do. Uh, we know those casks can be made. They used to be used in the United States, but they're not anymore. Cheap. Cheap is the way to go. That seems to be the sort of watchword. Thank you, uh, Arjun. Uh, Tracy, you're next, and then it would be Mari, I guess, Ingwe, um, and Margaret. So let's have Tracy, and then we'll talk to Marty and Margaret. Go ahead, Tracy. Thank you, Jan. Hi, Doctor. Our my my oh boy, Maki Johnny, Maki Johnny, Maki Johnny. You, you, I hope I'm not betraying my ignorance. You used the term heavy water. Could you please define that term? Yeah. Heavy water, so there are three isotopes of hydrogen. There's ordinary hydrogen that has one proton in it. So it has a mass number of one. Uh, there's hydrogen that has a proton and a neutron. So an element's property are defined by the number of protons in the nucleus. And um, so when you add a neutron, the mass approximately doubles, but the properties remain the same. So it's still hydrogen. Uh, and when you combine, so that hydrogen is called deuterium. And when you combine deuterium with oxygen, it's heavier than ordinary water because now deuterium weighs two, whereas hydrogen weighs one. 
So H2O has a molecular mass of 18 and D2O has a molecular mass of 20. So it's a little bit heavier than ordinary water. And so it's called heavy water. About, now don't quote me on this without checking, but I, if I'm remembering correctly, about one part in 1,000 of seawater is heavy water. And you can extract it because it has a different mass. You can separate it. Um, and uh, it makes a better moderator and in slowing down and sustaining a chain reaction in a reactor. And you can use natural uranium uh, in order to fuel, in order to sustain a chain reaction in a reactor. That's what the Canadians do. Um, and that's what mm, a lot of Indian reactors do. They are Canadian design, many of them. And so heavy water has become an important material in the nuclear business, both on the weapon side and the power side. Now there's a third isotope, which occurs in nature only in trace quantities. It has two neutrons and one proton, it's called tritium. Now that one is radioactive and it's one of the more ubiquitous pollutants that results from both weapons and power. Okay, uh, our next uh, interlocutor is Mari and then we'll have Margaret and, and then the uh, after Margaret Arney. Thank you. Um, okay. My name is Mari Inoue, calling in from New York City. Thank you, Dr. Makjani, for the presentation. I have a question regarding the nuclear disarmament. So uh, uh, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons entered into force last Friday, and I think that our next big step is come up with a plan to make all nine nuclear weapons they sit down and sign a legally binding agreement to destroy nuclear weapons in accordance with the treaty. But if you look at the state parties, um, none of the nuclear weapons they sign or uh, those states um, that rely on the nuclear umbrella of nuclear weapon states do not sign. Many Western countries do not sign, NATO countries do not sign, except uh, maybe Austria will be uh, the only Western okay. countries, yes. Um, so um, what do you suggest? Um, how can we come up with a plan to make those nuclear weapons they sign legally binding agreement? Well, Mari, this is awfully important and an awfully difficult question, as I'm sure you know. Nobody's got, certainly I don't have an easy answer or any, even, even a complex answer that sort of holistically makes sense, say, here's a strategy, here's a roadmap for nuclear free or nuclear weapon. No, I, I don't have that answer. But there is some good news in the way the treaty was done. As you know, we have a non-proliferation treaty that, according to the World Court, requires the nuclear weapon state signatories to achieve nuclear disarmament. In fact, India did not sign back then. India is not a signatory. Because even though they participated in the NPT negotiation, because they didn't think the nuclear weapons powers were serious about disarmament. Article 6, very weak. World Court said you have to do it in, in the 1990s. And obviously, they have not negotiated in good faith to get rid of nuclear weapons. We're not there. And the, we have the present treaty because people felt the nuclear weapons powers are not serious and started that process in 2005, if I'm not mistaken. So... The good side of that is, I think if the nuclear weapons powers had negotiated a treaty, it would absolutely be full of loopholes. Because the non-nuclear weapon states have negotiated a prohibition on nuclear weapons, it has provision for nuclear power. You know, it has become an article of faith, unfortunately. But other than that, it's a clean treaty. Now, it's not, it's not, a foolproof treaty by any means, but we're never going to have foolproof nuclear disarmament without having a better society because you can't get rid of all that plutonium. It's here. And you know, you can make it so it can't be used in nuclear weapons. You can have a repository, but there's no 100% going back. Uh, the only way to put the genie back in the bottle is to have a better society. I personally don't believe that I believe that nuclear weapons are the tip of an extremely violent system called the war system. I was part of a whole kind of a group of people that studied capitalism as a war system or capitalism, socialism, US, Soviet Union. The whole present structure is a war system. 
and what it would take to make a peace system. I mean, I don't think that book is on our website. It was a compendium of many authors. I was one of them. We will put it on our website. That's a very tough job. I think when they say no peace, no justice, no peace, I think you're t like climate, you're talking about peace at a global level that is based on justice. In the meantime, we can reduce nuclear weapons by de-alerting nuclear weapons, reducing weapons, you know, taking these weapons off alert, having some kind of security agreements where you don't have, you know, so many thousands of weapons on hair trigger alert, changing the posture. So my friend Bruce Blair, who I haven't talked to for a long time, used to say, if you make de-alert nuclear weapons so the length of time it takes to put it all back together and push the button gets longer and longer from 30 minutes or 15 minutes to an hour to 24 hours to a week, uh, a year, uh, people may realize these things are useless and get rid of them. And that's why there's some resistance even to de-alerting because you know, we can show that these things are useless. It's a complicated problem. I wrote a blog on January 22nd. It's on our website. Maybe somebody can go there and, and paste the paste the link. Um, I have suggested a global truth commission on nuclear weapons. And um, because the, one of the wonderful things about the treaty is um, that it's based on humanitarian ground. Nuclear weapons have already killed people. Nuclear testing has killed people. Nuclear testing has poisoned the earth. Nuclear testing has destroyed indigenous lands, you know, in Polynesia and the Marshall Islands and Nevada and so on and so on, Australia, Algeria, uh, Kazakhstan. Uh, now to be picky about, you know, which powers we're talking about. They've, they've all hurt their own people. Uh, we know more in some countries, including the United States and others. Um, IER did a whole project with IPPMW on exploring the health and environmental harm from nuclear weapons production and testing. We did three books, two of them are on our website. And the third one, Nuclear Wastelands, um, we recently agreed we're going to try to liberate from MIT Press and put it up for free download also, <laughs> but we haven't done that yet. So um, I've suggested a global truth commission. Let me do a straw poll here to see how many people would think that one of the first things the parties to the treaty should do is to convene a truth commission on how much damage uh, has been done by the development and, and testing of nuclear weapons and what um, what should be done to recompense the people who've been hurt. Not only the weapon states, you know, all uranium was mined in Niger and Congo. Some of the weapon uranium from Congo was used in the Manhattan Project in, in East Germany, you know, all over the place. So that's one step to awaken the public. Obviously, you know, without awakening the public, it's not going to happen. It's hard. And I am certainly open to any wonderful ideas from you, Maria. I would shut up and listen in case you have, you know. We can all go down to the uh, bottom. One, of oh. one more thing Sorry. is I think that the allies are different than the weapon states. U.S. has... Uh, nuclear weapons, I think, in five or six European countries, Turkey, Holland, Belgium, Germany, Italy. Anyway, I think I think um, we should work together to persuade the Europeans to send America. Repatriation of nuclear weapons might be a good idea to start with. U.S. is the only country to have nuclear weapons abroad. Okay, Arnie, you're next. Uh, unmute, Arnie. Okay, hi, hi Arjun. Um, hey, um, one thing for the group, I, I use a saying when I'm speaking that uh, talks about the the complexities and the nexus between uh, power reactors and the bomb. And I say that for the last seven, uh, seven decades, we've been picking up the pieces from Adams for peace. So it's a it's catchy. It gets people's attention. But Arjun, my, my thought is that my concern is uh, um, atomic reactors uh, in the generation that we're getting power from now are running at, at four to 6% enrichment. And I never was worried about proliferation given they were running at four to 6%. But I'm, I'm beginning to be very worried that the small modular reactors 
are pushing 20%. And um, most of the separate work is done at that point to, to rapidly get to a bomb. So I'm interested in your thoughts on the, the high, high enrichment in small modular reactors. Well, you know, there's just one problem with small modular reactors. Small modular reactors are another example of the nuclear establishment whistling past the graveyard. Basically, nuclear power, in my opinion, is an economic hospice care. And the question is, how long are they going to drag it out? You know, and how much public money is going to be poured into this dead technology? And they're going to be more guaranteed pretty much to be more expensive than the existing reactors. And they, if they reach existing reactor cost, it would be a huge accomplishment. And even then, they'll be three times as expensive as they should be. So, I mean, I, yes, I do think that small modular reactors having higher enrichment, whenever you have higher enrichment, you know, you're going to have greater proliferation risk. I don't think it's a qualitatively greater proliferation risk because so long as you have those if your safeguards aren't working that well at 4% or 6%, you know, yeah, it, it might take you two months instead of one month. It also depends on how many centrifuges you have spinning. If you have the kind of capacity like the plant in New Mexico, which makes four, four and a half percent uh, enrichment, I presume, since it's supplying American reactors, you know, you can, you can take a small number of those and make a couple of bombs worth of highly enrich uranium pretty easily. You just have to reconfigure how the pipes work uh, and the flow of uranium and, and you get highly enriched uranium. And, and of course that's not gonna happen in the United States because you already have too much highly enriched uranium and too much plutonium, but it can happen in, in say the Saudi Arabia builds an enrichment plant and that's been the concern with Iran and so on. So it's a concern, but it's it's qualitatively doesn't take you to a new step. Yeah, it, yeah, it does. It does increase the concern. Um, yeah, so we should we should make a modest effort to defeat small modular reactors. I'm actually preparing a preparing a a, a paper on the topic with uh, with my uh, friend Ramana at the University of British Columbia. Should be out in a couple of months. Yeah, he was on a very good video uh, that discussed small modular reactors. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway. That's why I want to collaborate with him. Right, yeah. He, <laughs> <laughs> um, now the next, uh, the next questioner is Bob Cruteau, and after him is Catherine Barnes, Barnes and then uh, Diane DeRigo, and then Laro O'Brien. So our next, go ahead, Bob Cruteau. Okay. You, okay. okay. So, hello, doctor, thank you. Can you hear me? Hi, Bob, yeah. You can call me Arjun, it's fine. Okay. <laughs> Um, well, um, and I've worked in the uh, utility industry uh, for 36 years, and um, we have coal-fired generating plants here in Springfield, Illinois. Um, they're phasing them down because, of course, the um, cost of to the environment, and it's a gradual, because it's a municipal utility, there's some public pressure to get rid of it, the, uh, the carbon. But um, there's a strong um, urging uh, and there's been a couple of comp uh, proponents in town uh, traveling around trying to promote the new age of nuclear energy and these smaller uh, um, uh, next generation units. Um, I've been very involved with renewable energy forever. And um, the um, excuse that you need the nuclear for when the sun's not shining or the wind's not blowing is really giving way to energy with storage, renewable energy and storage. And there is a Moss Landing, Pacific Gas and Electric has just um, upgraded. They've got a 400 megawatt um, Tesla battery storage project that they, they continue to add on to. And um, I didn't, never imagined we'd get this far this fast on battery storage, <clears throat> but um, I've attended some of these workshops and, and countered that we need to be looking at renewables with uh, storage instead of nuclear, another generation of nuclear reactors. And, um, uh, and you can have natural gas plants as quick transition um, generators. But I don't know if you've um, 
when you think about what has happened with cell phones and, and batteries, you know, and Tesla cars and, and the electric cars, this technology just is transformative. It's taking over. Um, is, are there any projections? Have you been looking at any of the economics around uh, that? I mean, what, what might be the time frame that storage could replace this perceived need for nuclear power plants? I'm going to put up a link to a much more recent and more thorough report on a transition to renewable energy. Carbon free, nuclear free was the first of its kind. It was a feasibility study. Can it be done? And the answer, to my own surprise, I didn't think it could be done. But to my own surprise, I did it because my friend and mentor passed away last year, Dave Freeman, the father of energy policy in the U.S., yeah, Green yeah. cowboy pioneer, brilliant man. Yes, very good. Uh, <laughs> and um, it was a wonderful to have been his friend and colleague uh, for decades off and on. Uh, he, he said we should go to solar and get rid of oil and coal and nuclear when solar was more than $10 a watt. And I said, uh, basically, it was economically impossible. And he said, you're being a knee-jerk naysayer. You haven't looked at the energy issue for a long time, so why don't you do it? So you know, I it was true, and and I was being a knee jerk naysayer, and I concluded that I had been wrong to say no, and um, but that was a feasibility study. This uh, link that I have put up was four years in the making. Making we had hour by hour modeling, we did energy justice. What about fossil fuel? We did the whole thing. It was a four year, very elaborate project. Alfred is familiar with some, some of you are familiar with this work, but I would recommend this to you. So the, there's a kind of an idea that a transition to solar and wind is easy. It's not. Uh, Transition from dispatchable sources like gas and nuclear to variable sources is complicated. It's not just going to be about um, solar and wind plus storage. Um, you can't have enough battery storage to make a transition properly and electrify buildings. And I've got a geothermal heat pump. I got rid of natural gas in my house. I couldn't put enough batteries to take care of a grid outage for a day in this house. It would cost too much. It would cause mining havoc if everybody did that. Um, you need balanced solar and wind. You need a number of elements technically. You need uh, a transformation of how utilities work. Instead of making money by selling kilowatt hours, they need to make money by making sure the grid is functioning for everybody who's buying and selling electricity, who's buying and selling reliability, who's buying and selling demand response, who's buying and selling aggregated storage capacity both ways. Are they charging your car? Are they discharging your car, vehicle to grid? Of course, you have to compensate. You need the grid. Uh, we, it's not a cowboy system we're going to. You know, I got my solar and storage and it's going to work. No, it's not going to work that way. Yes, you can do it in the middle of the countryside, but it's much more expensive. If you do that for 300 million people, energy will cost a lot more. And then what are we going to do about industry? So I like cheap energy, but I like clean energy. And that has to be efficient. So you have to marry those things. So you, let me tell you what you need technically. You need efficiency first. You need balanced solar and wind because you get more wind in the winter typically and more sun wind in the summer, more solar in the summer. So then you don't have seasonal imbalances. You minimize your storage that way. You still have surpluses. You need battery storage. And battery storage from the time I wrote Carbon Free Nuclear Free has gone from $1,000 a kilowatt hour or more to about hundred, maybe $130 a kilowatt. Um, it's, it's good. Battery storage is here. It's economical in many places. In Arizona, where they're not that fond of regulation, solar plus storage beat out gas for supply in the sort of in the hours that straddle sunset and late evening, your, your sort of prime time television hours where you have a lot of lighting and televisions and cooking. Solar is the cheapest. Solar plus storage was the cheapest, but that's not going to be cheapest 24 seven, 365 days a year. 
you need demand response. What is demand response? Many of you may not know there's a defrost co uh, heating coil in your freezers, in your refrigerator. That's what keeps your freezer defrosted. Every now and then the heater comes on, defrosts your refrigerator, so there's no ice buildup. You don't care when that heater comes on. But if a smart grid knew and there wasn't enough wind or storage in the battery, it could postpone the defrosting by an hour or accelerate it, depending on a weather forecast, by 12 hours, you'd get paid, credited to your bill. Similarly for, you know, when you have electric cars, you have vehicle to grid, you get paid to park in the airport if you're going away for a week, you lend your car to the grid, they charge it, they discharge it, you have a certain minimum setting for being able to drive home. And so you need that smart grid, you need smart appliances, you need the infrastructure for smart grid. Um, you have a lot of surplus supply in the spring and fall. You can, that electricity is basically free. So you can make hydrogen relatively cheaply with it. You can use hydrogen fuel cells for peaking power. So it's a whole different concept of system. Mm. It's not like what you've heard, you know, you so, sort of have wind and water and solar and you know, and you're good to go. No, I, I think you, you need a different structure. I evaluated the cost. I think it will be cheaper to do that than to go on with business as usual, certainly cheaper than nuclear. The last thing I'll say in the, in the context of this conversation is that nuclear is pretty much incompatible technically and economically with variable sources. Because nuclear really to be economical should be run in base load because it's capital intensive. And in order to support variable, you need for supporting power sources to go up and down. You know, they need to follow, uh, fill the gaps in the solar and wind. That means you can't keep the nuclear running at 90, 95% capacity factor. And you keep it running like gas, you know, combined cycle plants, 50, 60% capacity factor. Then nuclear becomes twice as expensive and it's already too expensive. So nuclear is very income. Once you reach 30, 40, 50% solar and wind, Nuclear becomes technically incompatible with operating that in, in the system. You have more and more curtailment. And this is something that hasn't been, you know, our friend Ernie Moniz is a, is a very smart engineer and he's at MIT, you know, I'm just a Indian in a small nonprofit, you know, but I would advise him to really be more frank about some of these issues. Our next it's complicated. It can be done. It'll be cheaper. We can do it. We can do it now. Catherine, now it's going to take 15 years. I mean, if we start now, we can be done 100% renewable in 15 years and do it well. Okay. Um, we have Catherine Barnes next, and then Diane DeRigo, and then Laro. So, Catherine, unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay. Um, basically, um, the um, nuclear industry seems headed towards um, SMRs. They call them um, advanced modular reactors now because they're in the process of getting them licensed. They have plans basically to put these things out uh, five or more at a time in a grid. Um, and they've been going through rural areas getting like uh, DTE, uh, these wind easements that they get, they have kind of like uh, open door towards other, you know, other things, other development. And I'm concerned that they're going to put SMRs all over the place. Um, and they're, when they were testing them in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, they did some really deceptive things. They tested them on a hilltop because they didn't want to address flooding because flooding, freezing, thawing, cracking, flooding, all that is a big issue with those things. With what um, things? Well, pardon? With what things? Uh, with the small modular reactor. Ah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so they tested them on a hilltop so they didn't have to address issues uh, where they would, if they would put them in places that would be flooded or, you know, and freezing and thawing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they have these in the United States now, my understanding is they've been putting them throughout southern states. Um, and they really are very slick 
in marketing these things, they're doing it throughout, throughout the whole world. It's an international movement. And they think just because they, they actually make them look pretty, they will pair them with a wind turbine. And then the SMR has like a little glass dome on top. Of course, the thing is buried down in the ground. Um, and it seems to me that you, you've got real problems with, um, you know, a lot of issues, nuclear waste, uh, leaking, cracking, et cetera, et cetera. And they want to, they, they, they're not even going to man them. They're going to like have a remote where they, you know, so there's the, the problem with terrorism. Now they, they're working to get these things down where they don't have to alert the community. They don't have to do environmental impact just a lot of things like that. So they're really gearing up to putting these things all over the place. My concern is that we need to get ahead of this. We need to stop it. I don't know if any group is trying to stop this. I mean, we're still trying to shut the big ones down. Um, we also need to stop this new, like little cancerous growth of all of this stuff. And I don't know what to do about it. Okay, Catherine, I'm not aware that there are any small modular reactors that have actually been built. There's a non-nuclear electrically heated version of a small reactor in the universe, Oregon State University, but it's it's not an operating reactor. It's a mock-up model with uh, electrical heaters inside to simulate the heat. Um, uh, the There's only one, so there are two types of small, so, there have been a lot of questions on small modular reactors. Let me take five minutes to explain them. There are two types of small modular reactors broadly, in my opinion. They're the what I would call the light water reactors. That's basically the same concept as the reactors we have now. Um, and there are several different versions of those. But basically, it's the same design. It's the same issues, the same type of fuel. So it's a kind of reactor that's reasonably well understood. Uh, whatever you think of them, there's a long operating experience with them. Uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has, you know, we all know what kinds of accidents will happen. We've seen some of those accidents happen. They've been debated, they've been analyzed, and so on. So licensing those, certifying those kind of reactors by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission so they can be built should be relatively faster and simpler and more straightforward. And they've been talking about it for 20 years and only one, the new scale reactor, has been sort of certified. They can claim to have a certificate, but they don't really have a certificate because they've got an asterisk on that that says, oh, please attend to the steam generator. Well, the steam generator is the one of the most, it's, it's the part that makes the steam that drives the turbine to make the electricity. And this steam generator is inside the reactor. It's vulnerable to vibrations. Well, if you have a vibrating steam generator inside the reactor, what kind of a certification you have to have? It's a fig leaf certification. That's taken 20 years. Um, that Oak Ridge project that Tennessee Valley Authority talked about, you know, in 2013, they said, we're gonna build this, it's gonna be great, Empower and so on, that was canceled. Uh, I think two out of the four companies that wanted to build SMRs have gone out of business. The new scale reactor was going to be built in Idaho. They got a lot of companies in Utah to sign on, small cooperative utilities to sign on to buy pieces of that. It was going to be built at Idaho National Lab. Uh, we're going to put half a dozen, as you were saying, you know, we're going to put half a dozen reactors uh, at the same site, so it'll be cheaper. The initial announced sort of um, come on uh, price was 3000 and change per kilowatt. Uh, the price is already up to $6,000 a kilowatt. They haven't even put in a bucket full of concrete in the ground yet. <laughs> and so, you know, it's going to, it's going the same way that the, I think we should worry about small modular, modular reactors, but mostly from the point of view of waste of public money and time, because we don't have a lot of time to fool around to solve the climate crisis. There's another type of, uh, uh, small modular reactor that's called, and even micro reactors that are called advanced reactors that are completely different designs. They're graphite moderated reactors, they're gas graphite reactors, they're sodium cooled reactors, Bill Gates' favorite. 
traveling wave reactor modification. They are liquid fuel, uh, liquid salt, uh, molten salt, uh, thorium fuel reactors that a lot of people love. Those are very, very, there are reactors that might make hydrogen that need to be run at very high temperatures. They're going to take a really long time to design and even apply for certification. And all of those timelines, I think, are not, in my opinion. This is nuclear, the nuclear industry whistling past the graveyard. And, you know, maybe they whistle very well. And nuclear power has kind of have become an article of patriotism in American politics since the 1950s. And so it's a very bipartisan thing to buy down and put some money and nobody can be against it. And, you know, even a AOC was, it wasn't in the original Green New Deal that AOC uh, designed with her colleagues, but now she's reluctantly had to say yes, because it's impossible to get anything done in, in, in Washington unless you give a nod. So it's our job to put in some effort to fight it. But I don't worry too much that we're going to have a lot of these things. And so far as I know, none exist as of now. I'm pretty sure none exist. Okay, I don't think Diane's here anymore. Diane, are you here? If you are, it's your turn to ask a question, but I don't see her on the list. Um, I'm here. Ah, good, okay. okay. Well, I have yeah. my question to ask Arjun if you could give us the sound bites against thorium reactors. Good, yeah. There's a a sound bite against thorium reactors. The sound bites, because- I see Kevin Camps has been, Kevin, you have been so sweet to go to our website. If you go to archives on our website in 2012, I think you'll see a Science Friday program where I debated thorium reactors. If you could put up that link for people, it would be very useful. As I said before, it's a, it's a, it's a link on your website that yeah, where you debated thorium. Okay. Yeah, I debated thorium reactors on Science Friday in 2012, I think it was. And there's a thorium fact sheet. Now, that fact sheet. The thorium reactor people, they don't like that fact sheet because I didn't discuss reactors. I discussed thorium and its use as a possible fuel. So thorium is not a reactor fuel. Thorium is plentiful. Thorium-232 is plentiful in nature, but it does not sustain a chain reaction. So it needs to be put in a reactor in order to make uranium-233. But you have to make the reactor go first. So to make the reactor go first, you need uranium-233. Now that's a chicken and egg problem, so we won't go there. So you need a fissile material. So you need enriched uranium, or you need plutonium to sustain a chain reaction. And then you put thorium, that's the breeding material, and it becomes uranium-233. Then you have to separate the uranium-233, which is a fissile material. It does not occur in nature an artificial isotope like plutonium-239. And then you can use that as a fuel. Now, the dream of the thorium people is that thorium is very, very um, plentiful, more than uranium. So we should go to thorium reactors. And uh, thorium molten salt reactors won't have meltdowns. Well, of course, they won't have meltdowns because it's already molten. Molten salt reactors. One of the advantages of the present reactors, relatively speaking, is that the fuel is in ceramic pellets. The ceramic pellets are inside a fuel rod. The fuel rod is inside the reactor, which is in water. And between the reactor and the atmosphere, there's a whole set of filters. So there are four barriers between the fission products and the radioactive materials and the environment. Now we know those four barriers can break down, but there are four. In a molten throat salt reactor, there is one, the filters, that's it. That's one thing. The second thing is such a thing has been made in pilot project form at Oak Ridge once, it ran for a few years. It ran pretty well actually for a pilot. You need the whole uranium plutonium fuel cycle to make these things go. One of the biggest vulnerabilities is it's the most proliferation prone because at every reactor, you have a separation plant for uranium-233. You can jigger it 
to separate pure uranium-233, separated from nuisance materials that make it hard to make a bomb. So while the US doesn't need more materials to make bomb, already got too many, uh, a country with thorium reactors that doesn't have bombs, they are a friend from West Africa who thought his country should have bombs if they have thorium reactors, they could more easily divert that cycle to make uranium-233 bombs than with any other reactor reprocessing type that I know about. The waste management headaches would be huge. The Oak Ridge reactor cost $10 million or less to build, about six, 70 million in today's dollars. It's decommissioning costs. It had not been decommissioned. It was shut down in the early 70s, if I'm remembering right. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Around 70, 71, around there. The decommissioning costs are north of $400 million. It hasn't been decommissioned. Why? Because the fuel is fluoride. You cannot dispose of fluoride. If they tell you it's just 300 years, you can store it, don't believe it. They have the same range of fission products like iodine-129, half-life 16 million years, one of the most problem radionuclides for waste disposal for the long term. So that's, a, I couldn't give you an elevator speech, but it's a very high elevator. If you're going to the Empire State Building, I'll be there. We're at the top. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, yeah. That that's important. Um, Laro, you're next, and uh, then Kale Walker and Howard S Siegel. So, Laro, are you ready? Can you unmute yourself? To be here. Uh, this is more a rhetorical question. Uh, is it even conceivable that a, a country like Greece would want nuclear power, but not the nuclear weaponry? Yes, yes, I think look, there are countries that want nuclear power, but not weaponry. Um, Greece is, of course, a NATO ally, supposedly covered by what I call a malignant umbrella. <laughs> so maybe they will, might not want weapons, but you know, when they have power, they could change their minds. Remember, there are two things. There's your intention, and then there's the capability. And the reason people look at the capability is you can always change your mind if you have the capability. If you don't have the capability, of course, you know, changing your mind doesn't arise. You can't just, you can't do it. Okay, Kale, you're up. I, I, I don't know how my hand got raised, but uh, I just wanna thank you for an excellent presentation. Oh, sure. I thought that you asked to be in the stack. Okay. Uh, Howard Siegel. Are you here, Howard? Yes, it's, it's Roberta. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks so much. This was, this was very enlightening, but it was technically over my head. And my question is pretty simple in the sense that what would your recommendations be, you know, and how would you prioritize them for the Biden administration? For what? For disarmament? Well, what do you consider the top priorities? If you had the president's ear, where would you start? Well, I, if I had the president's ear on the weapons side, I would say, you know, sit down with the nuclear weapon states, especially with Russia, and first talk about taking those 1,500 weapons or whatever are on high alert and taking us off of this nuclear precipice that we live on 15 minutes to doom's time uh, and total destruction. And, you know, then take that to a verifiable level so we are de-alerting and, um, and then have a more engaged process with the parties to the uh, Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons as to the steps that we need to take in order to, uh, in order to arrive at a state where you know we have universal elimination of nuclear weapons, it'll be a long process. But I do think the alerting. Then uh, the second thing uh, I would say is just withdraw the weapons from the NATO countries, repatriate those weapons. They're not doing any good. Uh, they should have been removed when uh, Daddy Bush, H. W. Bush who did the greatest disarmament in history by unilaterally uh, getting rid of tactical nuclear weapons when the Soviet Union was falling apart. And then Gorbachev did the same. It was brilliant, it was wonderful. Uh, I've said that they should have both gotten a 
you know, Nobel Peace Prize for that. I know Gorbachev got one for something else. I don't believe that Daddy Bush had been well enough recognized for it. Um, I, I do think that um, we need to put the surplus weapons usable materials into non-weapons usable forms like vitrifying the plutonium. Um, and this we suggested back in the 1990s, we've got a whole book on it actually, fissile materials in a glass darkly. Um, uh, that can be done on a slightly slower timetable. Uh, the, other, the other thing I would say is what my friend Dan Ellsberg advocates is get rid of the land-based uh, missiles. They are, they are you know, basically targets and first strike instruments. And finally, I would say, you know, get on a track to restoring the anti-ballistic missile treaty so we don't have nuclear missile defenses so-called are really the elements of a first strike system. That's why the Soviets and the United States agreed in the late 60s to an anti-ballistic missile treaty. It was thrown overboard unilaterally by son George W. Bush, I believe 2001. I think it was the first big step in the destabilization of post-Cold War Russia-US relations. Most people forget that. The United States unilaterally abrogated that treaty and withdrew from it. I mean, it was allowed to withdraw from it. All treaties allow withdrawal in some way or another, but it was a very bad destabilizing step. And I think we should revisit that, but probably multilaterally together with the, at least with the Chinese. So that's what I would say on the weapons. It's more complicated than, so I think he would have to lend me his ear for maybe five minutes. Uh, we're really uh, sort of out of time, but we only have two people left on the stack. I'm happy, yeah. And so uh, we'll just, Dave, <laughs> be clear to just go on? Yes, sure, go ahead. All right. If Arjun is willing, we can do it. Yeah. So this is, um, the next person is iPhone Kathy. I don't, I'm not sure I know who that is. And then after her, Alfred wants to ask another question. So those are the two people that I see. And okay. I'll keep looking. We could go back to Linda as well, who was skipped earlier. Right. Okay. So Linda, you'll be after Kathy and then Alfred again. Okay. Hi. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, this is Kathy Iwane. I'm with, uh, I'm in California with Samuel Lawrence Foundation. And I just, uh, thank you so much for holding this tonight. But I want to, um, if I could just, I can't emphasize enough. I can, I propose a truth commission at a congressional briefing and then take it to the UN. We need this now. And just, there are so many wonderful scientists of conscience that would join you and I don't know. But anyway, my question was um, not related to bombs at all, not related to, but it is related to the nuclear waste. What were your uh, barriers with the NRC when you uh, presented um, hardened on-site storage system? I'm just curious as to why we have not um, implemented this. Thank you so much for taking my question. Well, you know, I, I, my impression of the NRC, I, you know, I interact very little with the bureaucracy because Mostly they don't listen. I find I'm most effective when somebody wants to listen to me. And most, you know, I don't think the NRC wants to listen to me. We did that whole thing on spent fuel storage and, the, uh, and you know, we won the lawsuits and so on and so on. And then the end mm -hmm. the rule was worse than the one we started out with. Mm -hmm. uh, the NRC, hardened on-site storage has been presented to the NRC. It's been published in the peer-reviewed literature. Uh, the National Academies said that your, you know, spent fuel pools that are very heavily loaded, you know, with the re-racked spent fuel very closely packed together are risky. And the NRC's response is it's safe enough. And um, a Brookhaven National Lab uh, report from 1997 estimated that a severe, the most severe spent fuel pool accident. Um, this is with a full spent fuel pool with relatively freshly unloaded uh, reactor fuel and the reactor is shutting down just after reactor shutdown could cause in those days dollars, tens of uh, $500 billion of damage and 
tens of thousands of cancers in the worst case near a big city and so on. But they didn't include Indian Point in that calculation, interestingly. Mm -hmm. The um, in today's dollars, it would be north of seven hundred billion dollars. So, uh, but despite those numbers, the NRC said no. Yeah, you know, they did another study with different numbers, and so, <laughs> and so mm -hmm. instead of fixing the problem, you do another study with different numbers. So mm -hmm. the solution been out there. It's not very costly, but it does cost more money. And if you've got a regulatory agency that you know, shies away from imposing costs. A part of the problem, Kathy, was in the 1990s when the Yankee Row reactor relicensing didn't happen because of problems. And also the enrichment plant proposed in Louisiana, and I was involved in that. The mm -hmm. company threw in the towel after $30 million and said, this is too complicated. And yeah. basically they got a call from the Congress and said, it, it's not about whether you license, it's when and mm. you're going to do it and actually mr um a famous republican senator who's now retired dominici yeah dominici yes dominici has thank you has written about this in his memoir that basically we told the nrc you have to do this and um so when that is the regulatory situation so it's not that we have bad rules we, we don't have a very good enforcement system, and we have a system in which improving the rules has become impossible. Even after Fukushima, the improvement of the rules has been light, mm -hmm. not, not what it should be. So, I mean, I, I don't know how to fix that problem other than what I said earlier is, you know, we should fight for the states to have rights to impose stricter standards than the federal government, but not looser standards. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay, our our uh, board member Linda is next, and then Barbara Warren wanted to ask a question. So I'm happy to stay. Linda, go ahead, and then it will be Barbara, and then Alfred will come back to you. And I had a little question I want to ask, so I'll try okay. to save mine for let la let last. Okay, but Linda's next. Virgin, thank you for this wonderful presentation. You know, last Friday we had this landmark event, the treaty went into force, and uh, we on we are we on the reactor side continue to be deeply concerned about the siloing of these issues, the weapons side, the reactor side. That's why your talk is so important. But if you had quote the presidency, or if you were the president, or in any case, what would be your recommendations about how we could go beyond this siloing. I mean, here's this army of people globally, many of them, some of them are on this call, are on this, you know, uh, program tonight on the weapons side. And how do we engage in, 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 in bring these two sides to work together in the future? Well, you know, that that's a very hard problem now. I mean, I, I would tell President Biden to stop funding these new reactors and SMRs and all these shenanigans. It's just a waste of money. So, um, and it just gives, postpones the ideas. You've got all these plans. Um, uh, I, I'll give you a, a prominent study recently came out of Princeton. It's Princeton, everybody pays a lot of attention to it. But, you know, it has nuclear power in it. I mean, the numbers, you know, I should be able to agree with Princeton numbers, but I don't, unfortunately. I I like to call, you know, I like to call the numbers clean. And the atmosphere is such that it's almost obligatory to make this bow to the nuclear god and say, okay, we need nuclear power as any part of the mix, it's got a free. Except. I would tell Mr. Biden to demythologize nuclear power and you know. We've talked a lot about truth and lies. I really honor Mr. Biden. I, I am stunned by what he has done in week number one uh, on a number of different fronts. Um, I, it, it, I, did not ex I did not know what to expect. I was holding my expectations back, but I think I have to salute him. He's done very well. And I think, um, there's been a lot of talk about truth and science. Nuclear power was born in a deception. 
every study that was done until Adams for Peace said it would be more expensive. And then the same people went and did global propaganda. In Japan, shamelessly, they said, we're going to get rid of the nuclear allergy that would be referring to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So they would build nuclear power plants. And they did that. And we know where we are today. I think if you want to get to that, you have to admit that there has been a serious deception at the foundation of nuclear power. And while I'm at it, I should say that there has been a serious deception at the foundation of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that it was central to ending the war and it saved half a million American lives. And the Manhattan Project was about supposed to be about Hitler. That's why Einstein wrote that letter to FDR and said, please start a bomb project. I have said publicly that I don't think I would have more moral wisdom than Einstein did. I probably would have joined the bomb project. But I have also said that I hope that I would have had the moral courage in early December, 1944, when the Manhattan Project had definitive evidence, having occupied a part of Germany, the US and Britain, that Germany did not have a viable bomb project. At that point, you know, Nobel Prize winner, Joe Rotblatt, scientist at Los Alamos said, I'm done, I'm quitting and left. But he was the only one. And I have said for myself, if the Manhattan Project had been stopped then and said, like Rod Black, the job is done. Hitler doesn't have a bomb. He cannot hold the world hostage. He's losing, we're winning the war. He cannot hold the world hostage with a nuclear bomb before we have one. We should stop this. In instead, they accelerated. And the very famous great physicist Feynman, I'm sorry to go on. He said in 1980, in an interview with the BBC, and one of the things you might do, Kevin, is put up my talk from Pearl Harbor to Hiroshima, in which I describe all of this, 2012 also, December. The, the said that I don't, we were celebrating after Hiroshima. They were having like a frat party, uh, you know, one of those tailgate things that they have at football games. That's what he described while people were suffering and dying. Now, this is Feynman talking in 1980. He said, I don't, no, why we were doing that, why we were celebrating while well, that was going on over there. And then at the end, this is one of the most brilliant Nobel Prize winning physicists of the 20th century. And there were a lot of brilliant ones. He said, I wasn't thinking, okay. And that's where the interview ended. I would say that the whole bomb project from early December, 1944 to Nagasaki was a deception because it was supposed to be, the scientists didn't even mostly know that Japan had been targeted in 43. So you have, a, you know, the most in a way, the bomb system living with the existential threat that we have been for many decades now, and we know its nature since the Cuban Missile Crisis, we have not corrected these deceptions that are at the foundation of both the bomb and the bomb. And I would say, President Biden, I or honor you for having said your administration will be committed to the truth. Please tell the world the truth about the time from December 44 to Nagasaki and why the Japanese surrendered. The record is very clear and why the power project was started as a fig leaf on the hydrogen bomb and atoms for peace that had led to so much misery. So that's, I would say, the first thing to do to end the nuclear age is the truth. That's why I've suggested the Global Truth Commission. And what I will take away from this conversation, I mean, we're seriously thinking about it. We're at the beginning of the thinking. I suggested it in my blog on January 22nd. Again, I suggested it 20 years ago also in an editorial I wrote. But people, it has fallen on fertile ground at this time, I think. 
I'll come back to all of you, you know, we will have to mobilize to make it work. But I think it's the same problem at the root of both and it's created different arms of the same disease, basically different branches, different mutations, if I might say, of the same disease. Sorry to go on. Thank you Thank so you, much. Arjun. That was really a wonderful answer. Uh, Barbara Warren, can you ask your question now, please? Oh, sure. I'm sorry to keep you, Arjun, but I, I really wanted to know your thoughts about the Space Force that uh, Trump started. I really, I don't, I don't know what has been put in place already about that, but I'm a little bit concerned about the nuclear um, weapons in space uh, project. Yeah, the, I haven't looked at the Space Force since uh, Mr. Trump announced that, and the Pentagon seems to have wanted to establish it because I understand it's already established. I did write about um, weapons in space decades ago um, and how dangerous it is, uh, but I have not looked at it recently. So I must say, while I have been able to answer almost all your questions, this is something that, you know, obviously yeah. weapons, putting any weapons in space is not a good idea. And putting nuclear weapons is, in space is even worse. Um, and there are a lot of civilian assets in space. I mean, you can imagine the communications havoc that would be caused if a nuclear went off in space. Oh my God. Uh, the, you know, that's just for starters. And electric, anyway, uh, I don't want to speculate. I haven't looked at it seriously. I do think nuclear weapons explosions in space are banned under the atmospheric weapons, uh, you know, partial nuclear test ban treaty from 63. Um, nuclear weapons in space should also be banned. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I haven't studied though. I'm sorry, I can't, yeah. give, you a, I can't okay. give you a studied answer about what's going on. Yeah, okay, thank you. I do enjoy staying because you're, you ask such wonderful questions and you're such an engaged group and have wonderful things to say. So I'm learning things. And so I want to thank you also for hanging in there and engaging in, in this discourse. Thank you. Uh, Alfred, you have another chance because you put your name in twice for the stack. Go ahead. Uh, I, I thank you so much, Jan, and thank you so much, Arjun, uh, for this uh, wonderful discussion. Uh, when you talk about whistling past the graveyard, um, I just have to think that uh, I'd like to propose one more time, if I might repeat myself as a... Sure. A wonderful Madison activist once suggested to always repeat yourself, um, <laughs> you know, that really nuclear power is, in fact, the cover story for nuclear weapons. It, it is needed to have nuclear weapons. We have all this mainstream uh, distinguished thinkers who say it out loud in public we as activists who are concerned about nuclear weapons and nuclear waste and all that comes with it need to recognize that it is the weapons that are the driving force. And so in when we fashion our responses to it, uh, we would be, you know, well informed to do that. Okay. But, um, that, that, yeah. Will you send me? Will you send me the links to those reports so I can look at them? I'm, I'm very happy to. Yeah, they're, yeah they're, thank you, they're Alfred. Quite, you, you'll you'll find them quite interesting reading. I think. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Alfred. Uh, yeah. So I'm the last one up, and uh, I want to clarify something. I think I heard you say when you started this whole talk. I thought I heard you say um, uh, we need to. Okay. I I'll. I'll write down i'll tell you what i wrote down our most important advisors should be native americans did you say that i did because our foreign policy yeah oh because that i mean i've kind of gone off on this idea and uh i feel a little bit like uh it, it's really how are you going to tell people that that's true well i tried you know I, I'm an intellectual maverick and I like to explore all kinds of things. And after, after um, you know, about 15 years of working on these issues, I seriously started working on, on the nuclear issue around 1980, uh, 79. 
And um, for that, I was working almost purely on energy questions, not that connect, sort of on nuclear, but not that centrally connected. And I realized that, you know, in the nuclear arena, <clears throat> there was a lot of sort of cutting the corners on nuclear treaties, going back on nuclear treaties, you know, promises made, promises broken. And by the mid 90s, it was clear that the NPT is not being adhered to, you know, we're, we're not keeping our promises to get a comprehensive test ban treaty. The NATO, the, the NPT has shoved the whole NATO nuclear sharing under the rug. So there are a lot of things, you know, the US wasn't, uh, had not signed the Biological Weapons Convention. There was a landmine. There were a lot of things going on where the, but the United States was not looking like a good actor on treaties. Uh, we actually did a book on that with uh, John Burroughs and Nicole Deller. She was a young lawyer at the time, uh, just getting out of law school, worked brilliantly, called Rule of Power or Rule of Law. It was about whether the United States is adhering to its treaty commitments and sometimes whether it enters treaty commitments, looking basically to get out of them at a convenient time, if that should happen. And al along the way, it struck me that the people who have the most experience with how the US deals with treaties, makes them and breaks them at convenience, are Native Americans. Yes, right, yeah. And I thought that on the question of treaties, Native American leaders know the most, they know them in their gut. It's the same way that we talk about, you know, racism and uh, the whole question of how, how the policing should be restructured. There are people who experience driving like while black, walking like while black, you know, and having a broken taillight while black. Those are the, those are, you know, I mean, and all of these things have resulted in very serious, very serious outcomes. Just like Native Americans have had very serious outcomes with treaties. And so I have felt, and we have a parallel right now with agriculture and regenerative agriculture and thinking about indigenous practices. I think this is not to glorify everything. This, I think there is a real valuable, brilliant experience and some very experienced white people. Just like um, Robin Wall Kemmerer on in traditional agriculture and scientific agriculture. She's very brilliant. I, sh I think we should be listening to her on agriculture. We have similar people in the native world who know about treaties. And I think we should look to them in, you know, in the discourse on how we're going to get true adherence to treaty commitments comprehensive test ban treaty, non-proliferation treaty, and eventually the treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons. So I did make that as a very serious proposal. I, you know, it's an intellectual proposal. I, I don't know how you would operationalize it. Um, maybe the Indigenous Environmental Network or the um, National Congress of American Indians, you know, there are a number of many organizations out there who would be wiser than me in advising how to think the next step about this. But I'd be happy to be part of that conversation because I know a lot about the nuclear side of the treaties. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, sure. Well, Gail, I think uh, it's time to turn this operation over to you. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, I'm not going to be the last speaker. Dave has some last minute items to wrap up and talk about. And Thank you so much, Arjun. Um, I think everyone really needed this this week. There has been so much going on with uh, the nuclear issues um, and the changes that are happening under a new administration. Um, it's giving us a fresh look and a new hope for the future that maybe we can make some changes that seem to have been stalled for so long. Um, and so I think you have some brilliant ideas and we're all going to be subconsciously thinking about those tonight in our sleep to come up with some brilliant solutions. <laughs> Good morning, right, everyone? <laughs> well, Gail, Gail and David and, 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 and Dave and Jan, this has been very energizing. What a tremendous discussion. Thank you so much.
Thank you. And Thank I want you. to turn this over to Dave at this point. Dave? I know he's there. Yeah, he put, the, he put there his... I um, had to mute myself for a moment there. Sorry about that. So, uh, yes, uh, I first of all, I want to thank you, Arjun, once again for your for being with us again. It's it's been a, a treasure to work with you all these years and to have you with us tonight. Um, I also want to thank Kevin Camps for being the uh, self appointed uh, archivist and adding a gazillion interesting links into the chat box. The other announcement is next month, we will be uh, doing some advanced uh, observance of the 10th anniversary of the Fukushima disaster. Uh, we have guest speaker Bo Jacobs, who will be our uh, speaker next month. It will be the last Thursday of February, same time, same place, same link. So we hope you will be able to join us and encourage you to invite others to, to join as well. So again, uh, thank you, Arjun. Thank you, Kevin. Thank the team here, Gail and, and Jan and the board. And I want to thank the, all the rest of you who spent the evening with us tonight. We hope you'll join us again real soon. So back to you, Gail. No, no. And thank you. Gail, you with us? We, you're frozen. Our animation. Oh, I almost forgot. Uh, tomorrow, we will be sending around a new link to an animation that's been sitting in the can, unfortunately, far too long. We did a 12 minute animated uh, uh, short about why uh, nuclear power is not a viable solution for the climate crisis. So that link will be sent around. It's already posted to YouTube. I uh, neglected to put it in the chat box here, but we will be sending it around tomorrow. Uh, give it a look and pass it along to people as well. And our YouTube uh, name is Nuclear Energy Information Service. You have to type in the whole name for our YouTube channel. That's it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Have a good evening.